Well, I want you to start today by doing me a favor. I want you to think about the last time that you held a baby, okay? I want you to think about the last time you held a baby, and everybody kind of has their way of holding a baby. I love to kind of like scoop up a baby, throw it in my arms, hold it like a football, right? Like, which makes new moms incredibly nervous, doesn't it? And then you have like the people that are the bouncers, right? Like you might be the bouncer, the baby bouncer. And then there's my wife who likes to like snuggle the baby like right here. Like she's always snuggling a baby right here. And I know it's because she likes to like sneak her nose over and sniff the baby's head, right? I have never in my life smelled a new baby smell, ever, ever. But she swears it exists. And like she's like right here sneaking like sniffs, right? So we all have kind of that, their, your way of holding a baby. And, and I think there, there's something about like picking up a tiny human and looking at them and they will, they'll coo at you, right? They're so peaceful when they're sleeping there. And then they go absolutely nuts. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Like, okay, where are the parents of this kid? I need to hand it back right now. Now, now I want you to kind of take it a step further with me today. I want you to do me a favor. And I want you to think about the first time you held your kid, your child. I want you to, to think about that moment. And, and in doing that today, I, I know that there are two people that I want to address today as we're in the room. There are two people I want to talk to, and I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Uh, the first group is, if you're a teenager in this room, I need you to look at me right now, right? If you're a teenager, a young adult, or a college student, look at me right now. Hey, I know that you're looking at me, and you're going, hey, look, I am so far from holding my child. I am not even close to thinking about that. And, and I get it, right? Like, thank you. That's good, right? That's good that you're thinking that way. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to lean in today. I want you to think about the idea that you are now responsible for a human. You're responsible for this little kid. You're responsible for them, for, the, for their care. You're responsible for raising them, not just like today, but like for the rest of their life and for the rest of yours. There's a couple of adults in the room that are like, I don't know, sure. I'm still not, like I, I have a kid, I'm not ready for that. And the second group of people I want to talk to today is I know that in a room this size, there, have to, there has to be someone in here, there have to be some people in here who are like, I just wish I had my kid. I just wish I was able to hold my child. I just wish I had a child to hold. And like, I get it. I know that that's hard. So like, I, I, our family, I have two daughters. I have two daughters and I love my daughters so much and they are, they're amazing. But we had our first daughter uh, biologically, God brought her to our family biologically through my wife. It was, it was awesome. And then we went through a phase where we, we were not able to have a second child. And I, I understand that there's hurt and loss and sometimes tragedy and grief and pain that comes along with that. The waiting, the difficulty in the waiting. And then God brought our, our younger daughter to our family through adoption no different, no different, the same. He put our family together very specifically and for a very specific purpose in very different ways. But I, I understand for you today, if, you are, if you're sitting here today and I understand you're, you're sitting in the midst of that hurt and that pain and that grief and that loss, that it can be very difficult to, to kind of lean in this moment. But I wanna, I wanna ask you to do me a favor. I believe that God has something for us in this illustration today. I believe that God has something for us in this idea of holding your child today. And so I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna invite you just to, to lean in, please. Even in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the grief, in the midst of the hurt, please lean in with me today. Because I think, I think God has something for you today in this. And so for, the, for us today, I want you to imagine you're holding your child for the first time. And that little baby has done nothing so far in life except for cause pain. I mean, think about it, right? Like pain to your body, pain to the anxiety and the stress in the interim period, maybe that grief and pain, nothing but cause pain so far. And on a lighter note, right? Like pain to your nose because you did not realize how bad diapers can smell. Pain to your eardrums. Whenever you can't figure out, I, okay, I know it's supposed to be hungry, tired, or wet, but I don't know which one it is. And then just like screaming, pain to your sleep schedule, and pain to your wallet. Everything about babies is expensive. 
And there is this little thing that has done nothing but cause pain. And you pick it up and you look down and you look into that face and you realize like for the first time you look at them and you go, this thing has done nothing but cause pain. But I'm not sure I can love anything more. And that is where we're going to be today. That is where we're going to be today in Mark chapter 11. So I want you to do me a favor. Open your Bibles, Mark chapter 11. All right, so as we're going there, as you're going to Mark chapter 11, I just want to walk through a couple things. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to Matt for the invitation to come and to speak today. Um, I, I'm so grateful to be here. Our family, we're, we're, we're just a part of the faith family here at Sanctuary. We've been here about six years, um, and I've had the opportunity, we have the opportunity to serve. My wife and I have to serve in student ministry, have for a long time, um, and, and I've had the opportunity to speak for some of our student ministry retreats over the years. So some of you, if you have teenagers or college students, they may, they may have been around and, and gotten that opportunity, so glad to be here. Great to Great to be able to teach today uh, and to walk us through this. Um, the second thing I want, to, I want to kind of say is this. We've been in Mark chapter 3, right? We've been walking through the book of Mark. We've been in, we were in Mark chapter 3 last week. We will come back to Mark chapter 3, but for the next two weeks, uh, we're going to be kind of focused on Easter, so we're going to jump ahead in the book of Mark uh, today into to chapter 11 and next week to talk a little bit about the Easter passage. And so we will be back after that to Mark chapter 3. But before we kind of dive into the text today, I I do want to say this. I want to kind of walk us through a little bit of the book of Mark. I'm going to kind of give away a few things, but Matt's going to be fine with it. Don't worry. He'll come back and he'll do a much better job than me anyway. So what we're going to walk through, if you break the book book of Mark down, there are two halves to the book of Mark. And the first half of the book of Mark is all about his teaching, his ministry, his miracles, and his authority. So he's building up on his teaching, his ministry, his miracles, and authority. And then we get to Mark chapter 8, right? And so in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 30, you have kind of the the crux in the middle of the book of Mark. And so it's kind of like you're building up, you're building up, and you get to Mark 8. And that is where Jesus looks at his disciples and says, who do people say that I am? And the disciples, they look back at him. I think they're a little bit nervous, right? And they say, uh, well, some people, say that you're, uh, some people say that you're John the Baptist, come back. Some people, some people say that you're Elijah, returned. And like still others say that you're one of the prophets. And I think he's kind of like, I think he kind of goads him a little bit. He's like, okay, 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 fine. That's good. I like it. Who do you say that I am? And he looks at him, and Peter always like first out of the gate, right? He's like, well, I... I I believe you're the Christ. I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you're the king that we've been waiting for. I believe you are that guy. And in some of the other gospels, it's interesting because you find Jesus say, okay, yeah, that's great. In fact, on that rock, I'm gonna build my church. But in Mark, we have this thing called the messianic secret. And in Mark, we have this, it's kind of an underlying theme of the book of Mark. It's basically that Jesus is not trying to tell people that he's the coming king. He's trying to let them figure out and also trying to kind of keep it a secret until it comes out at the end. And so in Mark, he looks at him and he says, hey, do me a favor. You got it. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. So we have the build up, right? Teachings, miracles, ministry, authority, Mark chapter 8 the confession that you are the Christ, you are the the, the coming king, and then everything after Mark chapter 8, everything from Mark chapter 8 through Mark chapter 16 moves very quickly toward Jerusalem, the cross, and the tomb. Okay, so you have two halves, the buildup, Mark 8, and then Jerusalem, the cross, and the tomb. And so today we're talking about the entry into Jerusalem. So let's go go to Mark chapter 11, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, and I just want, Jesus sent two of his disciples. Kind of, this is, this is where we kind of start. And I want to do a little bit of background. They're coming to Jerusalem. They're probably staying in Bethany with, with Martha and Mary, right? We, we, we know them from, from other passages in the, in the Bible. That's probably where they're staying. They're staying in Bethany. And Bethany's about three miles from Jerusalem. So it's about a three mile, two and a half to three mile walk from Bethany over to Jerusalem. And then you have this little town, Bethphage, right? It's like a, this little place that, that, interestingly enough, we don't even know where it is. There's a couple of churches that are, that are the church of Bethphage, but actually we don't even know where that city is. And I think the reason is because I think it was such a small town that somewhere along the way people kind of moved to the bigger cities and it, it kind of went into disrepair, fell down, and I think it's been covered up and we just never found it. And so we have Bethany uh, three miles away, we have Bethphage, which is kind of this small town right there in the middle. And here's what Jesus does. He says to his disciples, these two people, these two disciples he picks, we don't know which ones, 
Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back shortly. And there's a couple of things as we look at this passage together. There's a couple of things I want to point out. I have three, three observations I want to point out. The first is this word cult. And I think this word cult is really important here because this, cult, this word cult is not used very much. It's not a very common word. And so it would have been a word that kind of stood out to them. And it's actually like a young donkey. It's not, we think of a horse, right? You think of a colt, you think of a horse, but it's actually a young donkey. And so he basically says, hey, you're going to find this young donkey, this colt tied up. And I think for a lot of people in that period of time, if you knew the Old Testament, as soon as you heard the word colt, you would actually think of Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine. Now, we don't think of it that much because we don't, you know, a lot of times we're not as schooled in the Old Testament as they would have been in those days. But that word cult would have, would have taken us to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Let's, let's take a look at Je- Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your coming king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I just leave that up there for you. I, wanna, I just want to say that this is what would have come to mind. This is what would have come to mind when they had this idea of a cult. And it would, have, it would have pushed them to this passage. And I love this passage because it's basically like, hey, listen, the, the, the king is coming. But I'm gonna, I just want to make, make a statement this morning. I'm going I'm to, like, this is not a political statement. This is, just a, this is just a statement about, like, leadership in general. Like, how many of you, who of us, like, wouldn't want to follow a leader who comes and is righteous right? Who cares about salvation, who cares about helping people, who cares about bringing them out of their hurt and their mess and into healing, who's gentle and who's humble enough to ride on a donkey, right? Like, isn't that the kind of leader that you would want to follow, right? Isn't that the kind of person that you would want to get behind? Wouldn't you want to get behind somebody who's righteous, who does what is right, who brings healing, who actually like cares and is gentle, and somebody who's humble enough who isn't, who isn't self-righteous or self-seeking? I mean, come on, right? Isn't that a lesson in leadership for us? Like, this is the kind of person that we want to follow, but this is the king who was supposed to be coming. And, and, and we know, right, like now we know, with the benefit of 2,000 years, we know that's Jesus, isn't it? So we come back to verse 2 and 3. Come back to verse two and three, and I think the second observation is this, is this statement right after there, you're gonna find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. And just a quick note on that, the, the interesting thing about that is that in the Old Testament, working animals, right, so working animals like cattle and horses and, and donkeys, those kind of working animals, only unridden working animals could be used for sacred purposes. Only unridden animals could be used for sacred purposes. And so this, it's interesting that this cult would be unridden because it would be reserved for a sacred purpose. Now, think about this. They're going to Bethphage to pick this thing up, right? They're going out to Bethphage, which is a small town, a very small town, so small that now it's disappeared. Small town to pick up a cult that's never been ridden. Now, I don't know how many of you guys came from small towns. I don't know how many of you guys came from small families. I don't know how many of you work in small businesses. But like in, in small places, most of the time, resources aren't plentiful, are they? And so like a working animal that has never been worked would be hard to find in a small town, wouldn't it? Like in your small business, would it not, would it not be hard to find a working resource that has never been used? Like if you just had extra money laying around, would you be like, I don't, I don't think we're just gonna leave it. I don't, we're not gonna touch it. I don't wanna use it. Like in your house, if you have limited resources, right? Are you just gonna save somebody? Like, I just think we're not, we're not gonna use that resource. It's like a lawnmower that you have out there. You're like, yeah, but like, do I really want to push it? You know, like, no? Okay, fine, yeah. And so this, it is interesting that this, that there is this unridden, unused, unridden cult there in the town. And the last thing that I, the last observation I have is Jesus gives them the words to say. He knows what they're going to face and he gives them the words to say. And wouldn't we often, isn't that what we want a lot of times? 
mean, how many of you in here have ever prayed the prayer like, God, would you give me the words to speak? God, would you give me the words to say? And wouldn't it be amazing if it was this clear all the time? Hey, look, somebody's gonna come to you and they're gonna say, why are you doing this? And this is exactly what you need to say. Tell them the Lord needs it and he's gonna bring it back shortly. Wouldn't that be great? But I do think God gives us words. I think he often gives us words that say, there have been times where I've been running through the words that I should or might say, and there have been times where I've landed on a phrase and God's like, hey, that's it right there. That's that's the one, you should say that. And I, I love the fact that in this moment, he gives them the words to say. So those are three observations that that I just thought were interesting and we needed to pull out here as we continue. Verse four through six. They went and they found a colt outside in the street tied at a door. And I'll just, for a second. These guys, like they're walking into this small town and they they get to this small town. You know, they're walking in the city gates and they're like, I don't know. He said like, he said we're gonna go into the town and he said we're gonna just find this like unridden donkey and they look up and they're like, oh my gosh, there it is, like right there. Like, is that the moment where they were like, all right, fine, fine, I get it, Jesus. Like, again, another time where you're, gonna, you're doing the thing right now, right? You're doing that thing where, where you tell me to do something and it happens exactly like that, right? And so then they continue. And as they begin to, so they begin to untie it and they begin to untie it and the guys, and somebody says, uh, sorry, they begin to untie it. Now I'm lost. Oh, here we go. Oh, they untied it. Some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. And here's the crazy thing. It happened just like he said it would, didn't it? And I have just a second of conjecture here. Like this is not in the Bible. This is not in the text. This is like, this is just my thought. Wouldn't it be interesting if these people that saw them recognized them? Maybe they were a part of the 4,000 or the 5,000 that got fed that day. Maybe their relative was one of the ones that was brought to be healed. I mean, obviously everybody in the area would have known that Jesus is coming and is staying in Bethany. He was that famous that when he came to Bethany, which is not very far away, everybody's talking about Jesus is in Bethany. And what if they had seen these disciples before? And so they're walking into the town and those, the, the people are looking over and they're like, those are the guys that are with Jesus, right? Aren't those, those are his disciples. Those are those, those, are those ones that are, that are going with him everywhere. And then they walk up to this unridden donkey, unridden colt, right? That's tied up that's being reserved for a sacred purpose and they begin to untie it and they look over and they're like, nah, man, those guys are trying to take the colt. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, what are you doing untying that colt? What are y'all doing untying the colt, untying that colt? And they're like, uh, well, Jesus told us to say the Lord needs it and he's going to bring it back shortly, Right? just exactly like they had memorized it. And these guys go, you're telling me that unridden colt right there, that colt, that unridden colt is for Jesus to, to ride? And they go, get it out of here. Get after it. Let's go. It's time. Okay, good. You're gonna take the unridden colt and Jesus is gonna ride that thing in? Get after it. Have at it, my friend. And so they let him go. 100% conjecture, Right? Don't know it happened like that, but man, I wish it did. I hope it did. And then we get to verse seven. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it, right? He starts to ride it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And this is just acts of honor. They're honoring Jesus in this moment. They're stepping into this moment and they're honoring him as he rides through the town. Now they would have learned this in the Feast of Tabernacles. This was not a, this was not a terribly uncommon thing for them. They, this was part of a tradition that they would have a parade every year, the Feast of Tabernacles, um, and they would spread uh, palm branches or branches on the ground as part of the celebration, as part of the parade. And so that's where they learned it. It's where they knew it from. You know, interestingly enough, the Feast of Tabernacles is about God residing uh, out with the people as they traveled not in the temple, and so, funny enough, that whole thing was about to happen again. That God was about to begin to reside with the people instead of the temple again. So that's what they're doing there. And then finally we get 
uh, finally we get to kind of the, the part that everybody loves here, right? Verse nine. And so those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now, last week, you can leave that up for just a second for me. Uh, last week, we talked about the Mark sandwich, right? If you were here last week, Matt talked about a Mark sandwich, and, and Mark has like five or six of those sandwiches throughout the book. This is not one of them, but this is kind of like what we would call a Mark mini sandwich, all right? So like this is kind of the mini sandwich. This is actually, um, the structure of this passage is something that was very common in their culture. It was very common, especially in the Hebrew culture. It's called chiastic structure. You don't need to remember that. I just said that because it's cool. Um, but it's, it's, it's basically, if you're, if you're into poetry, it's an A, B, B, A format. Well, well let, let's walk through it because it's, it's a little easier to see on the screen, all right? So here's our A, B, B, A, right? It's an A, B, B, A format. Right, so you have the things that are A are gonna match, the things that B are gonna match. All right, so you have Hosanna is your first A, right? And then your B is blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now this is interesting because Hosanna originally would have meant save us. The Hebrew word as it, as it comes out would be save us. It's kind of, and it becomes this declaration of praise. It's like God save us, but it, but it becomes a praise of God. Now, here's what's interesting, right? Like, like, you've probably sang the word Hosanna before, right? We sing that in songs here. How many of you are going, just save me, God? You're like singing that song, and you're like, save us, save us. Is that what you're thinking? No, not what you're thinking, is it? You're thinking, praise God. That's probably what they were thinking. But what they were really saying in the moment was save us. Save us. That's what you're really saying when you sing it. Think about that next time. That'll be fun. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that could have been anybody who came as a representative of God, a priest, a rabbi, a teacher, a prophet. And so what we're gonna find in this ABB format, this little mark, tiny mark sandwich, right? This little slider, I guess, that's, that's a tiny sandwich, right? I'm using that in the next service, don't you worry. Um, <laughs> blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What you're gonna find is the A and the B become intensified in the next B and A. So what you hear first is a statement, and what you hear second is going to be the intensification of that statement. And the, the focus is actually on the bees, right? The meat of the sandwich. It's, it's, it's focused in the middle. So we have Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then let's look at the other A before we get to the second B. Hosanna in the highest. See, it's an intensification of the first. So you got save us, save us big, Right? Save us, save us big. And then you have, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Now this, whether you realize it or not, is an intensification of the first B. The first B is blessed is he who comes on God's behalf to mankind. But that statement, the second one, is blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David is a messianic statement. Is a God would you send our king and not only that, but it's like, hey, blessed is the guy who comes in the name of the Lord, but blessed is the guy who comes to bring the kingdom of God now. Save us. Save us big. King coming in the name of God. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what that statement says and what they're saying in that statement, whether or not they actually realize it in the moment or not, what, they're, what that statement says is, hey, this, this is our king right here. This, this one riding on the colt, the unridden colt into the city is Hosanna, is our salvation, is the one who's coming in the name of the Lord, but the coming kingdom of David. This is our king. You know, there are a couple people, everybody brings something to the table in life, right? And as I want to think about today, like the people who are in this passage and kind of what they're bringing to the table. And I kind of think of them as like being a potluck, right? They're like, I mean, if you guys, anybody here, like you, you've been to a potluck? Any, nobody? Sweet, thank you. I appreciate it. Like per, crowd participation, A plus today. Um, how many of you have been to a potluck? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that, we're getting better. Um, and like when you go to a potluck, you ask questions like, hey, uh, who brought that? right? 
Because like, it's like, oh, Aunt Susie brought that. It's like, oh, great, Aunt Susie brought that. I am not touching that, right? Like, no <laughs> doubt. And so everybody in this passage is like coming to a potluck and they are bringing something to the table. And so like today I wanna just talk about three perspectives and those three perspectives are like things that people have brought to this potluck. And first you have the crowd. And the crowd has brought, they have brought their perspective to the potluck. Each one of these perspectives is like a dish. And so they've kind of brought theirs to the potluck. They kind of, they kind of brought their thing to the potluck and, and here's what they brought to the potluck. The people, who looked at Je- the people looked at Jesus with honor, excitement, humility, and praise. They looked at him with honor, honoring what he had already done, like who he already was, that he was a prophet, he was a, that he was a priest, that he was a teacher. They were honoring, for, honoring him for who he was, but also who he might be, that he could possibly be the Messiah. He had all those qualities. He was righteous. He was gentle. In that moment, he was riding on a donkey. The question was whether or not he could bring salvation. They were honoring him for that. They, they had excitement, right? Because they could feel something was different. They didn't know exactly what it was. They weren't sure exactly what was happening. They could tell something was different. And it was becoming even more different every day. Humility. I, if you're gonna throw your cloak down, right? Or if you're going to drop a branch, you have to bend your knee. And I don't know, man, let's, I don't, like, you have to kind of kneel. And I don't know if you've ever knelt to anyone or anything in your life. But there is a sense of surrender that comes with getting on your knee or on your knees. There is a sense of humility that comes with getting on your knee or on your knees. And they were bowing before Jesus. And then finally, praise, right? Coming back to that word, Hosanna. They are praising him. They are, save us. Save us big. But they're not the only ones, right? They're not the only ones who showed up at this potluck. No, 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 no. The disciples came to the potluck too. And they brought a little bit bigger dish, right? And theirs is a little bit fancier maybe than what the people would brought. But they came, to the, they came to the potluck. And the disciples brought, you know, they brought... They brought wonder and expectation and anxiety. You know, they, they brought wonder, expectation, and anxiety. Because the wonder is basically this. It's like, hey, listen, we've heard that he's the Messiah. Peter confessed it. We were all there, and Jesus didn't deny it, and he told us to keep it a secret. But, like, are they figuring it out? Is the rest of the world actually figuring out? Like, as everything unfolds. It's happening just the way he said it was going to happen. And there is this wonder in their mind of, like, man, I can't believe God. Is, this, is God actually doing this? But then there, there's expectation. Like, look, they expected, right, rightly or wrongly, they expected that Jesus was going to come in, he was going to take over, and he was going to rule in Jerusalem. And they, you know what else they expected? That when Jesus took over, and he sat on the throne as king, do you know who else they expected was gonna be sitting next to him? Yeah, them. All right, so they had this expectation of like, hey, if we could just go ahead and do this, I'd like to sit on your right or your left. I don't care, I, look, the, everybody else, they can sit wherever, but if I could just have your right or your left, if I could be the most important, I wanna rule with you. And they thought, hey, look, everybody else is gonna be looking at us. They had this expectation, rightly or wrongly, right? And then finally, they had anxiety. Like they, they believed it was gonna happen. They just didn't know how. They didn't know how. And, and actually, they didn't know if the next step was gonna be one of peace or if it was gonna be all out war. So there was some serious anxiety, I'm sure, as they walked uh, through the streets and as they laid down the palms and as they shouted Hosanna. They did not know what they were gonna ent- get to, uh, what they were gonna have waiting for them when they got to Jerusalem. And... and there are three perspectives we're going to look at today. We're going to wait on the third one for a second because I have, I have just one more that I want to ask because I do think this is important. It's like one of my favorite bowls that we have at the house. Um, what about you? What are you bringing? What do you bring to this story? What is, it that's, what, what is it that is underlying in your life right now as you're coming to this story, as you're thinking about Jesus, as we prepare for Easter, right? As we have one week until we get to Easter, what is it, that's, what is it that you're bringing to the table? Is it wonder 
Is it amazement? Is it honor? Is it praise? Maybe it's anxiety. Is it frustration? Is it anger? Is it unmet expectations? What is it you're bringing? Like, the, you, you get to come to the potluck too. This is, this is your party too. What are you bringing to the table? What is it that you have that, that is coming with you? As you look at Jesus, what lies underneath? And in fact, I want to kind of clear the stage a little bit and clear the table because I'd like for you to, to just kind of dive into that a little bit, right? I want, to take, I want to take all these other things away and I want you to dive into that mainly because we do have one more perspective we're going to get to today. And I think it contrasts or maybe it, or, or maybe it aligns with kind of what you have, but in this perspective three is the perspective of Jesus. Perspective three is the perspective of Jesus, right? And, and, and I think, I mean, honestly, like, I mean, like it would be bad of me to not come up here and say that I think Jesus brings the best perspective, right? And this is like, I commissioned this cake from my daughter. She's our baker. This is like her triple chocolate bundt cake. And this thing will just like knock your socks off. Like I, I know those of you who wore socks today, you're not allowed to try it because you won't be able to wear them home. Um, and I think we're gonna save that, right? This is Jesus' perspective today and I think it's the best one. And, and, it's, and we find it kind of, we, we find him in Mark chapter 11, verse 11. We kind of find him at the end of the story. They go on, right? So Jesus, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, now listen, they left behind the crowds that were shouting and all the palm branches. They left all that behind in Bethany and in Bethphage and they cross over, they cross through the valley and they get to the gates and they come into Jerusalem. And he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went back out to Bethany with the 12. Now this is kind of a weird passage, right? Because what would we expect him to do, right? He'd expect him to come into town and be like, let's go. No, that's not what happens. Don't worry, we'll get to the rest of the story, right? But here's what I love. This little bitty phrase, and it's kind of a throwaway phrase, but like until you like look at it and you see it, you don't recognize it. He looked around at everything. He looked around at everything. And I, I, what I wanna, what I wanna say is, I think he walked into the temple he gets there. He's not in like the depths of the temple. He's in the temple. And he just sees. He just looks around and he sees. He sees the people who are coming and going. But he doesn't just look at them. He sees them. He sees the depth of who they are. He sees the depth of what they're bringing. He sees the depth of their desire, the depth of their hurt, their pain, their rejection, their needs. He sees the temple itself. He sees what God is doing. And he's he's. He's observing and actually seeing. And here's what I think, here's, here's what I think Jesus' perspective is. Jesus' perspective, this is one of them, but Jesus' perspective is he knew, Jesus knew this is how it was supposed to be. It was, he was supposed to enter in on the donkey. He was supposed to save Jerusalem. He was supposed to become the king. He was supposed to rule there. But at the end of the day, what he really knew was this is not how it's gonna be. Because he knew that that triumphal entry was going to be replaced with beatings and carrying a cross and a brutal death in a tomb. And what everybody expected was not how it was coming. Yeah, of course, this is how it's supposed to be, but that's not how it's going to be. And I wonder sometimes, like, is that, is that kind of how our life is sometimes? <sighs> yeah, this is, that's how it should be, but that's not how it's going to be. That's what God is doing, but that's not how he's gonna do it. That's how I want him to do it, but that's probably not how it's gonna go. <laughs> the crazy part is that God's way was better. God's way was better. Because the second thing I think Jesus was thinking, and this is one of the things I think was going through his head in that moment, and I think this is where we, this is what really, like, the, the kind of where it hits us today is this, that one week can change everything. God, if you'll just leave that up for me. One week can change everything. In fact, in one week, from seven days, from where, where Jesus stood there until seven days later, separation between God and mankind was removed. 
that the curtain in the temple would be torn from top to bottom and God's presence would come out with the people. His church would begin in those moments and it would begin to spread across the whole world and end even sitting right here with us today, right? And lives would be changed. One week can change everything. And so I, I just asked the question, if one week can change everything, what would you like to see changed in your life? If one week could th- change everything, in you, for you, around you, what would you like to see changed? Would it be work? Look, I always come back to work because work's one of my issues, right? Like I just, I struggle, like that's where I struggle. I struggle with, with just always kind of being focused and thinking about work and, and kind of I get distracted there. And so for me, a lot of my change is just about dealing with work issues and maybe whenever those things change, things are gonna be easier or better. Or maybe for you, maybe it's not work, maybe it's finances. Maybe you're looking at a mountain and you're, you're saying, I don't exactly know what's gonna happen, but God, I need you to move. I need you to change something here. Or maybe it's your marriage. Maybe you're, you look across the table at your spouse and you go, God, I just need you to change. So if, if you could change something there. Or maybe it's your kids. Maybe there's an issue with your kids right now and you're like, God, would you, would you yeah, I need you to change this. Or maybe it's your parents, right? If you're a teenager in this room, you're looking you're like, God, I don't know what you're doing, but like, over here, right? If you could just do a little magic over there, it'd be great. Yeah, maybe it's friends. Maybe it's direction. Maybe it's purpose. I don't know what it is. But what would you like to see change? What would you like to see change? But I think there's a deeper question that's even deeper than this, right? There's a deeper question, and that, that is, what would God like to see change? Because a lot of times it's easy to ask this question, right? But it's like, okay, but yeah, but like what does God actually want to change? God, what do you want to change in me? What is it that you want to see be different? And, and I think, interestingly enough, it's a, it's, it can kind of sometimes come down to internal versus external. The changes, because a lot of times what we want to see change is kind of the external stuff. It's the circumstances and it's all the things around us. And the truth is, like in reality, what I think what God often wants to change is what's inside of us. And, and here's the crazy part. The crazy part is that if he changed the things around us, yeah, of course, God could change that immediately. If he changed that, I think sometimes he's saying, I'm not gonna change that. The main reason I'm not gonna change that is because you wouldn't be different. If I changed that, if I took care of that, if I made that happen, if I took that away, you wouldn't change. And I think in this moment, if we ask the question, like, God, what do you wanna change? I think a lot of times what God really wants is he wants to bring healing to the places that you've been hiding. Amen. <laughs> Could not make that happen better. Thank you. I don't even know. If you're watching online, I'm sorry you missed it. Um, God, I think, wants to bring healing to the places that you've been hiding. It may be somewhere deep. It may be shallow. I don't know what it is, but it's maybe something you've closed off and maybe God is saying, hey, I, I just want to bring healing to that today. Or this week, I can change that. Maybe it won't be completely and totally and utterly different the way I've changed things in the past, but we can start. We got seven days. And you know why he wants to change it? Do you know why God cares about reaching into the depths of who we are and making it different? Because when he looks at us and he looks it down, he could see all the pain and the hurt that we've caused, right? Every single time that we've caused and created hurt, he could see every single place where we have been nothing but pain. But when he looks down at us, everything changes. And he says, oh my gosh, I can't imagine loving anything more. In fact, I love you so much that I'm gonna send my son to die on a cross. I am gonna send my son to go to the tomb. I am gonna send my son to pay for your sin so that we can be together forever. And I just wanna change this in you because I want to be with you. And when we change that, I will be closer to you than I was last week. One week can change everything. And so today, if you're open and you're willing, right? If you're willing to lean in and be open to that. At some point in time today, I just want you to whisper or say, or even in your own head, just say, Hosanna. God, save me. Maybe Hosanna in the highest. Save me big today. Seven days from now to Easter. 
God wants to meet us in the middle. I think eternity meets us in the middle. Save us, we pray. Let's pray. God, thank you this morning. Thank you that you are here to save us, God, that you are here to change us, that you are here to make us different than we were. Thank you, God, that you are not a God who leaves us in the depths, that you are a God who brings us out of darkness and into light. And so, God, would you this morning meet us in this place, bring us out of darkness and into light. Thank you for loving us, loving us like newborn children. Thank you for not leaving us the way we were, but changing us and making us new. Thank you for your son, Jesus, for all that he did so that we can come and be with you today. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.